I'm going to start out by giving you a fairly concrete example uh, to illustrate some of the issues that I'm going to discuss before I tell you what the general picture is, because I think this little intro will make the, um, the concepts a little bit more concrete. So I'm going to start with something that on the surface looks very mundane. I want to talk about arrays. Um, and arrays in C++ are pretty much the way they are in C. And so not only did C++ inherit all the good properties of it, but, but a fundamental confusion about the true nature of arrays in C and C++. So there, there's your basic array declaration. It says that X is an array with N elements of type integer, where N is some previously declared integer constant. And the uses are unsurprising. You use the subscript notation down there in the, in the way of that. An awful lot of other programming languages use subscripting. That's not surprising. You know this. But the part that gets interesting is that for some reason or other, you can treat arrays, the name of an array, as if it's a pointer. So you can do things like this. You can use the unary dereference operator to simply say, treating that array name as if it were the name of a pointer, dereference that thing and give me the, the element that it points to, which is not an entire array. It's a single element of type int. And you can even combine the dereferencing operator with pointer arithmetic to essentially um, access any element in the array. As basically, that is the same thing as writing x square bracket k. Again, that's fun. Most people who program in C and C++, you get used to this fa fairly quickly. It's one of the things that makes C, C, is this relationship between pointers and array. You can then go ahead and do things like that, where you're initializing a pointer with the name of an array. And so after that, P and X are essentially aliases. They are two different names naming what appears to be the same thing. Namely, you can write, you can go ahead and treat the pointer as if it's an array using the subscript operation, or you can use treat the pointer as if it's a pointer using pointer arithmetic and the dereference operator. So in short, there are all these ways in which you can treat an array as if it's a pointer. And so it raises the question, is an array really just a pointer? What is its true implementation? And I have found over many, many years of teaching this that when I poll C and C++ programmers and say, what's the real type of when you declare int x square bracket something, what's its type? Awful lot of people say it's a pointer. And that's not true. Um, it, it, it turns out that arrays aren't pointers, that there really is such a thing as an array type. And when you declare an object of an array type, it isn't a pointer. So this is really an array, not in the sense that this thing is a pointer. And that's a fundamental confusion that I've encountered many, many times in dealing with C and C++ programmers. Just out of curiosity, if somebody would be so gracious or bold, uh, how many of you share this confusion in coming in here? Yeah. And are willing to admit it. By the way, <laughs> admitting it doesn't make you a bad person. It just, it means that you've been misled. And it's a common, a very common point of misunderstanding. So that raises a question then, well, why does this work? What's really going on inside the compiler? to make this work? And the answer is that there is this phenomenon which is known informally as arrays decaying into pointers. And what it really is, it's an implicit type conversion. And that's the point of this little story here is that this is one of many, many examples throughout C++ where you get implicit conversions on operands and expressions that are so common, so and so uh, subtle in, in many ways that people get tricked into thinking that the true nature of the things that they are dealing with are not what they really are. 
And that's the point of my discussion today, is help you to give you some basic ways of looking at the way the compiler works so that you can have a better insight into really what's going on with your programming <coughs> uh, exercise. So what there is, officially, it's called an array to pointer conversion. And that when you write an expression, an assignment expression that says, pointer p is assigned the value of x, the compiler will look at this and say, that's a pointer, but that's an array. And you can't take an array and stuff it into a point, an entire array and stuff it. It just doesn't fit. So what do you do? The compiler applies a type conversion to that operand and transforms it from an array into a pointer for the purpose of evaluating that expression. And in fact, what it does, it, and this is important, this is really important, is that the transformation is not a permanent transformation, it's temporary. It's that the decay happens just enough to make this evaluation happen, and then x remains an array. That's its true nature. Now, let's make a comparison. This is something else that one does in C and C++ quite commonly, which is the ability to mix in a given arithmetic expression, you can have operands of different types. Like here, what we're doing is adding an integer to a double. Now, informally, what we often say is it converts i into a double. But that's not really what happens. That's a, a casual, an informal statement of actually something that's more complicated than that. And now, it's not in, you know, amazingly complicated. It's just a little more complicated than that. It doesn't really change i into a double. Here's what's really happening, is that the compiler will create a temporary object of type double and initialize it with the value of i converted from integer into double. And then it will use that temporary to complete the evaluation of the expression. And notice that I've placed curly braces around this so that the lifetime of the temporary object is limited to a very short span in the program. In, in C and C++, you can always introduce an extra set of curly braces to bound the scope of any variables that are declared inside there. And so this is transformed by the compiler into that. And that's very similar to what's happening with the array, is that, even, that when we had operands that were one was a pointer and one was an array, the compiler said the only way I can make this work is if I take the array and treat it for a moment as if it's a pointer to its initial element. And I'll use that pointer value to complete the expression. But does the array remain an array? Yes, it does. Now, what's really tricky, and what I think is the, the cause of most of the confusion is that it's easy to see evidence that the integer i really is an integer. Because later on in the same code, you can access i, and you can see it's still an integer. It wasn't transformed into a double. But with arrays, any time you just look at the array, with very rare exception, it says, OK, I'm a pointer. The transformation of arrays into pointers is so common that most C and C++ programmers start thinking, it's just a pointer. It, it isn't really an array. And so, for example, here with this initialization, it converts that x momentarily into a pointer. When you compare a pointer to an array, that's valid. It works by transforming that into a pointer, but just for a moment. When you take an array and pass it as if it's an argument to a function, it doesn't copy the whole array. It passes a pointer to the initial element of the array. In other words, it's very, very hard to access an array and not have the conversion take place. And because of that, a lot of programmers think that arrays are pointers. So how can you tell? Anybody know? How can you tell that an array really is an array? Yes, the size of. 
That's the way, that's... Oh, but before we get there, I, I forgot to mention that even the square bracket operator, if you look up in the specification of C and C++, how is the square bracket operator defined? It's actually defined as a pointer operation. It says that x must be a pointer and i must be something that's an integer. And if it turns out that what you provide here is an array, it says, okay, I'll turn it into a pointer and use it as if it's a pointer. Again, that transformation is only momentary. It's not a permanent transformation. It's creating a temporary and using that temporary pointer for completing the expression, but then it throws away the temp. So here's how you can tell and, and take the size of it. And I gave, I particularly chose this so that it wouldn't have the same size as the pointer. I, I do not know of an architecture that has 32 byte pointers. So what you almost certain to get out of this is 32 is the size of X, but the size of P depending upon whether you're using a 16, a 32 or a 64 bit architecture, you might get two, four or eight as the answer for the size of. There's also a built-in, now in C and C++, there's a built-in align of operator that will return information about the alignment characteristics. Uh, in, in the event you're unfamiliar with this, it's relatively new. Um, the align, a lot of um, processors have a requirement that certain data must reside at addresses which are multiples of a certain value. So very common that an a 32-bit architecture would have four-byte integers residing on addresses that are a multiple of four. And if you have an integer at some other address, you get spurious behavior. Yes? I'm sorry, the, see, what happens is, let, let's just be, make sure, you, you, here's a situation where it doesn't transform into a pointer. Okay, so what it will do is, it will, by definition, a character is always size one. And so this will be 32 times one. This one. Yes, yes, but, but if, if I, um, for example, take uh, char x, Oh yes, if, if you had put a number here that happened by coincidence to be the same size, then yes. But that's why I chose 32, specifically to make this example work. Okay, because I don't know of a, mach I don't know of a machine that has pointers that are 32 bytes in size. Yes? It's, uh, just a quick one. So can you use a line of to tell a pointer from a single element array? Uh, can you use a line of to tell the difference between a pointer and a single element array. Um, if, it's a, if the element type is uh, let's, a, a, a single element array of characters, for example, is that? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah a, a, the alignment of characters, I, I'm not aware of any machine where the alignment is anything other than one for character data. And um, so if you had an array with one element, that would have an alignment of one. The size of when you use the array, if, if you used an array name uh, to get the align of that, um, oh yeah, but a pointer to a character would still be aligned on the alignment of a pointer, which is almost certainly two or four or eight. So you would be able to tell the difference. Also the size of the difference in this particular yes. case, this one. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I mean, Here's the, the, the key takeaway here is that almost all the situations where you use an array in an expression, the compiler will apply the array to pointer conversion to treat that array as if it's a pointer for that expression. But in the size of expression and the align of, the array to pointer conversion doesn't happen. That's my point is this is one of the few places where you can tell that an array is not a pointer. There, there are, uh, by the way, just 
to add to the confusion, array parameters really are pointers. When you declare a function with a parameter whose type is array of, that is not an array, that really is a pointer. This is just two different notations for declaring a pointer parameter. But aside from, from this, all other arrays in C and C++ really are arrays. Okay, so that's the example that I wanted to use to motivate this. Now, here's the general lesson that I want to try to, to cover, which is C++ often quietly transforms expressions from one type to another. And it will happen in a variety of different settings. For example, when you're evaluating expressions, when you're passing arguments to functions, especially when there's overload resolution, you have overloaded functions and the compiler is trying to choose among them. Now there's a mechanism called template argument deduction which is used, it, on the surface many times function templates look a lot like overloaded functions, but the machinery inside the compiler for figuring out what's going on there is fundamentally different than overload resolution. And my point in, in talking about this is, to, uh, I have an example in a little bit to illustrate that the set of conversions applied here is different than the set of conversions applied here. And also when you're throwing and catching exceptions, the type that is, appears in a throw expression does not have to exactly match the type that appears in the catch clause that catches it. And when that happens, there is a type transformation that happens there as well. So here are the key points that I'm going, to, I'm going to tell you the points here and then I'll give you a variety of examples to illustrate them and then I will repeat these key points at the end. So first thing is to remember, every object and constant has some innate type. We, we often don't think about things like, well, what is the type of zero? Well, it's an int, but it, is it a signed or an unsigned int? It has, it has an exact type. And knowing what that exact type is, is, is helpful. C++ often quietly transforms things from one type to another. And these transformations may have a runtime and a cost both in the size of the code and the execution time of that code. In my experience with working with people who do embedded development, people who have rigid requirements for speed and space consumption. I hear this complaint sometimes from them, saying that, gee, the, the compiler is doing too much magic, transforming things from one type to another, and it's injecting cost into my program that surprised me. And so one of the reasons why you wanna learn about this is to take away the surprises to be able to predict when this happens and to be able to control it. And that's another point is the permitted transformations are not the same in all contexts. That there are things that you can do in different settings which will allow some co conversions to happen and others not to happen. And then the last point I wanna make is, and you have some control over this. I'll give you a few examples of how you can influence the compiler's choice of transformations. Now, uh, just to clarify before we go on, I wanna talk just a little bit about the nature of type analysis in C++. There are some programming languages that don't require that you declare objects before you use them. And what will happen is you just do an assignment and that assignment determines the type of that thing at runtime. So you assign a character to it, X is a character. Later on, you can assign a string to it, and now X is a string. And then later on, you assign a floating point to, number to it, and now X is a floating point. It's a dynamic type system. And so what happens in languages like that is that there are certain checks. The ability to validate a given expression cannot be done at compile time, it has to be deferred until runtime because that information about what type it is can vary 
depending upon the execution path. So for example, here, there, there's a, a common everyday expression. Most programmers can read this, and the question is, is that valid? Well, if x has an integer value, that's valid. But if a little later you assign x a string value, a lot of programming languages would say, no, that's not. I don't know what it means to add one to a, a character string hello. But here it is, same expression, and its validity can't be checked until the program runs. And my point is C++ isn't like that. Okay, so I just wanted to, for those of you not familiar with this, this ain't C++. In C++, the type information is almost exclusively static, meaning that it's processed at compile time. When you declare an object, you set its type, and that's it. That type can't change during execution, so that int is always an int, that double is always a double, and that pointer is always a pointer. And there's nothing you can assign to it that changes that nature. That's a statically typed language. The exception to this, just truth in advertising, is C++ does have the ability to have type hierarchies based and derived types with virtual functions, and those types actually have both static and dynamic type. But the t even there, the dynamic type information is very restricted. It's very limited as to the set of different types you can assign to a polymorphic type. So for the purposes of today's discussion, I'm going to pretend that that's just, I don't like to lie pe to people by giving them an oversimplified story, but this is a corner case we're not going to talk about today. So what is a static data type? It's actually a bunch of compile time properties for an object. I was thinking about what does it really mean when you say something is an int? What does it mean when you say something is a pointer? Well, it's actually that the compiler, for the built-in types, the compiler has a knowledge base of what these properties are. And they're built in. So for example, one of the basic pieces of information when you say what's an int, it has a certain size in bytes. It has a certain alignment in bytes. That's the, the, the mechanistic stuff, the low-level details. Here's what's really interesting is that the type also specifies the set of values that can be put into an object of that type, and it also specifies the set of operations that you can apply. So for example, um, type int on a typical 32-bit processor the size and alignment will be four bytes. And the range of values will be from there to there. It's on the order of what, two uh, billion, uh, trillion, something like that. Um, there'll be a set of operations, unary operations like plus minus, the address of, the logical not, and the complementary negate, you know, negate operator. Um, there are binary operations like plus minus times divide equals less than greater than that sort of stuff. Before I go on, let's just think for a moment. What is an operation that you cannot do on an int? See, what's important is not only the set of things you can do, but the set of things you can't do. What's an operation, a built-in operator that applies to some types, but that can't apply to an int? Anybody got an idea? Pardon? Dividing. Dividing? Yes. No, you can divide. You can divide an integer by an integer, can't you? Yeah, I can. I could take ten, ten divided by two. How about the subscription operation? Hmm. Subscription Yes. Well, actually, <laughs> um, in, in other words, you couldn't do something like it, like the requirement with subscript is a pointer, a square bracket, and an integer. You can't have integer, square bracket, integer, That's right. right? That's an example. And if you can't do square bracket, what's another operator you can't do? Reference. Yes, star. You can't say star i, right? There's a set of things you can't do with an integer. And that's true of any number of other, like for example, with floating point arith arithmetic, you can do add, subtract, multiply, and divide. You cannot use the percent operator which is modular divide. What does it mean to do a modular divide of a float? 
I don't know. And neither did the people who designed C and C++. So you can't do it. By the way, uh, int also comes in some varieties like short and long, 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 and you can have signed and unsigned. So what does C++, so before we go on and look at these transformations, an important perspective to have is what does C++, or for that matter, any language that uses static type information, what do they do with that type information? There are a lot of things they do with it. I'm gonna give you what I think are the two big reasons. One of them is they simplify programming through overloading. Most operators, built-in operators, are overloaded. And it makes life easier to most, for most programmers. And it also improves early error detection. Let me give you just a quick example. Right here. This is, these are all using the plus operator. But notice, this one is adding two integers. This one is adding two floating point numbers. And this one is adding a floating plus an integer. Now, when we are conversing, talking to other programmers, we do not call this an integer add, a floating add, and a mixed float and int add. We just say add. And that's because we understand, we, we quickly internalize that plus is a high level conceptual operation. And in mathematics, you have integer types and floating point types, and you can mix them, and it just makes sense. The mechanics of how this is done is usually a detail we don't care about. And so this is a, a, a form of built-in overloading, but it can only be done if the compiler has information at compile time to be able to figure out what's going on. And by the way, wh what really happens here, once again, is that the compiler does an implicit type transformation. In order to add y plus k, what it does is it takes k, runs it through a conversion to turn it to create a temporary object whose value of type double, whose value is the same as k, it then does arithmetic using floating point operands and then throws away the temporary. And all of that is made possible by the type information in the compiler and the implicit conversions that are supported by that. So again, conceptually, it's all just arithmetic, but when you look at the machine instructions that are actually generated, integer arithmetic almost always generates different sequences of machine instructions. But the compiler uses type information to abstract that away. And that's valuable. It makes, it makes your life easier as a programmer. Here's the other thing that it does for you, again, each time you write a declaration, you include type information, and one interpretation of that is, how do you intend to use this? When you write a declaration like i as an int, what you're saying is, I intend, I intend to use that only for doing integer arithmetic, or I intend to use this only for pointing to other integers. And, and if I ever use it in any way other than as a pointer to an integer, please catch my mistake. It's almost certainly a mistake. Please inform me. And so compilers can, can then look and say, well, P is a pointer, you're dereferencing it, that's okay. But if you try to say pointer plus double, now you can do a pointer plus an integer, because that mimics array subscripting. But a pointer plus a double, what does that mean? Do you want to index to the middle of some array element? I want the one and a half element. You just say you can't subscript for the 1.5 element. Well, because we don't know what it means. So rather than let, you, let this compile and then let you have the fun of debugging it, Modern languages reject that sort of stuff, and they use type information to do it. Okay, so compile time type checking is a good thing. It turns potential runtime errors into compile time errors, and that makes them easier to locate and edit. That's the key point there. So with that perspective, I now want to focus on the real subject, which is these implicit conversions. Is that C and C, uh, I mentioned C++ has a rich set 
of implicit conversions. That means the compiler will do these conversions quietly. Now, on what basis? See, we just went back here, and if we go back a couple slides and say, you know, there's a way that the compiler could make something like that work. One way would be to just say, I'm gonna just quietly truncate that floating point number into an integer, and then I will give you that. But the consensus uh, on, among the language designers and the standards committee was, no, it's probably better to inform the programmer that he or she did not mean to do that and reject it. So, so the question is, well, then why are some in conversions allowed to be implicit and others not? And for the most part, it's just based on accumulated experience over decade or two of developing a programming language and seeing how users responded to things. If you look back at the early documents on the C programming language, it had a very, very casual attitude toward implicit type conversions. You could, in the very first C compiler, convert a pointer to an integer into a pointer to a float. You could just assign one to the other. And the compiler would say, pointer, pointer, okay. And then programmers would find my code is compiling and I'm getting core dumps. In those days, that's what you got. Now you get a dialog box that pops up that says, your system is hosed, okay. But in, in the old days, you'd get a core dump. And so th these set of implicit conversions is really just accumulated experience about what's easy to use and what's not. It's a judgment call made by the language designers over time. So the general rule is that implicit conversions are safe. The things that the compiler allows to happen quietly are things where it appears that there is no loss of information, that in general, once programmers know that implicit conversions can happen, they find that these conversions are unsurprising in their behavior. For example, converting a single character into an integer is an acceptable implicit conversion. There's no loss of information. An integer is always at least as big, has as many bits as a single character, so you don't lose information. You're allowed to do that. Converting an int into a long int, same thing, harmless. Converting an int into a double, right? Now this one, it turns out, is a little bit more controversial because you really can lose some bits in what's called the significand. For example, if, a, if you have a, um, it turns out that this is a 64-bit int, if that's the representation, and that is a 64-bit double, this is going to actually have probably eight bits of exponent and 56 bits of significance. This one has 64, this one has 56. And so actually now in C++, this is known as a narrowing conversion and some compilers will issue a warning about that. But it is generally, the, the legacy of C is that that is a safe conversion, generally. Converting float to double, perfectly safe. A double is always at least as big as a float. And in general, converting a pointer to T for any type T into a pointer to a constant T is considered to be perfectly safe. There's no hazard in that. Because this one says, I've got a pointer that can point to things that I can both read and write. And I'm going to uh, copy it into a pointer that I can only read. What's the harm in that? In other words, it doesn't violate any uh, protections on that. Okay, so uh, it, in the terminology of C++, these implicit conversions on built-in types are known as the standard conversions. Now, how about the explicit conversions? Well, it turns out these are ones which are generally unsafe, but programmers have found the need to do them occasionally. And so um, rather than prohibit them outright, say you cannot do these conversions, we say, yes, you can do them, 
but you have to ask for it explicitly. You have to tell the, basically what will happen is you write some code, the compiler will complain about it saying, this is not a valid conversion. You look at it for a moment and say, yes, but I need to do it. Thank you for pointing it out. Now shut up and let me do it. And the way you make it shut up and let you do it is by writing a cast. That's, that's what a cast is. And that should be your understanding of a cast operation is this is an announcement to the, to the human reader and to the compiler that yes, I know that in the general case this is unsafe, but I have a reason to do this. And so I want to be allowed to do it. That's what a cast is. Another example Oh, by the way, why is converting a pointer to a void into a pointer to an integer generally unsafe? Because a pointer to a void could be pointing to anything. It's, it's an unchecked pointer that could be pointing to a float or a string or a widget. And then when you take a pointer to void and convert it to a pointer to int, now you're saying, I'm certain there's an int in there and the compiler says, are you really sure? If you're really sure, then say it. That's what the cast is. Here's another one. Converting a, an integer into an enumeration value. You see the enumerated type here only has three valid values. The underlying mapping is that that will be represented as 0, 1, and 2. But an integer could have a value in it that's well beyond that range. So when you convert an enumeration into a, an integer, you need to cast it. Now C++ lets you do function overloading, meaning you can have two functions with the same name but different parameter types. And so when you do function overload, uh, overloading, the compiler has to have a way of figuring out from a given call which one of the overloaded functions is being called. It does it by a process known as overload resolution, which involves essentially doing a type match between the arguments in the call and the types of the parameters in the function declaration. Let me illustrate this with a simple example. I have three functions, all named f. And first one takes an int, second, long int and a pointer to a character. And what I want to do is call it, I, I want to call a function f passing at zero. And most of you know which one it's going to be right away, but let me go through and show you in a little bit of detail how the compiler processes this. It will first ask, can I pass that zero as an int? Can I pass it as a long int? Can I pass it as a pointer to a character. And if for any of these the answer is no, that function is removed from consideration and it will be left with a smaller set of candidates that could win. Now it starts by understanding that even a literal like zero has a type. Zero, these are, these are decimal integer constants and they have a type. It's not just int, it is a signed int. It's specifically a signed int. Things like that, that has type double. Those are character constants. Most of that's pretty obvious. And, but you can even control exactly what type it is. For example, you can turn 10 into an unsigned by putting a u. Or you can turn 10, which is normally an int, into a long int by putting an l. So every constant, has a type and you have some control over exactly which one it is. Well, there's actually a set of rules that say if the integer is small enough to fit into an assigned integer, then that's its type. If the value is bigger, then it's a long int. And if it's bigger than that, it's a long, long int. Okay. Interestingly, with hexadecimal numbers, this, the rule is if it's big enough to fit into an int, if an int is big enough to hold it, then it's an int. And if it's too big for that, then it tries unsigned int first. And then if it doesn't fit in an unsigned, then it goes to long int and it will work its way through. So there's, yeah, there, I'm not making this up. 
th those are really the rules. But anyway, it, it works something like that. But it's all built in, and it's standard across all compilers. OK. So anyway, now what we want to do is we want to figure out which of those three functions is the best match for this. Well, one of them is taking that 0, which is an int, a signed int, and passing it as the same thing. This is what's known as an exact match. If we took the 0, it turns out the 0 can be passed as a pointer by doing what's called a pointer conversion, because 0 is very special in C and C++. It's, the only, it's an integer that can be converted to a null pointer. So that actually works here. And, and the nature of the conversion is it's called a pointer conversion. And then you could also take that 0 and pass it as a long by doing what's called an integer conversion, which is widening it. So we have three choices. Now, it's obvious, I think, to all of us which is the winner, which is the compiler always prefers the cheapest conversion. Compiler's lazy. So it says, well, the cheapest of all is an exact match because that's no effort. It's already an int. I'm passing it as an int. What could be simpler? So that's not all that interesting. Here's what gets interesting. Let's eliminate the obvious winner and say, OK, now we're left with these two. Which one is the best match? See, now it has to choose between two conversions which are not exact. What do you think it does? Well, again, we can, tur can turn an integer into a long integer. We can turn that yeah. into a pointer. Yes, and the return type never participates in this decision. It's only based on the parameter types. Anybody have an idea? You think it's this one? Yeah. Okay. So we have one bold person who's willing to take a gamble. Anybody else? You think it's a compile error? Why? Yeah, you think it's a tie. And, and you win the prize. That, in fact, is the answer, is that here's what the compiler does, is it actually has a table built in that ranks the conversions according to an informal notion of cheap and expensive. And there's a, a bunch of ones which are like the no conversion is clearly cheap. But it turns out our array to pointer conversion, which we saw a little while ago, is also considered to be so cheap that it's as if it's as cheap as no conversion at all. Then there are a set of what are called promotions. This is the conversion of a character into an integer or a short int into an int, things like that, or a float into a double. And then there is anything else involving built-in types. And it turns out that the two conversions that we were just looking at were these two. And it's a tie. And when it's a tie, the compiler says it's a compile error. I'm not, going to, I'm not going to arbitrarily pick one. So ties produce errors. What is the difference between conversion and promotion? What is the difference between a conversion and a promotion? The difference is that, and this is really more of a historical accident than anything else, but in the early days of C, C did not like, to, compilers did not like to pass things uh, as arguments to functions as anything smaller than an int. So a promotion is conversion of either an int to a short int, I'm sorry, char to short int or char to int. Anything that's converted where the target winds up being an integer is an integral promotion. Anything that involves an integer larger than a plain int is an integral conversion and those are more expensive. It's, it's a real hair splitter, as we say, but, that, but that's the difference. Okay, so that, now, if you use a C++ compiler, and it, it, after a while you get familiar with the error messages, um, it's very common that if it can't find anything that matches that zero, it'll say there's no matching function. 
But if there's more than one equally good best match, it'll just say the call is ambiguous, meaning it's a tie. <clears throat> okay. By the way, the literal zero is the only integer that implicitly converts to a pointer. If you change the integer to anything else, this is never considered. It's rejected at the beginning. The only candidate left is that. So this calls that. And similarly, a constant like one will also call that. This will not be considered. Zero is special. So let me just uh, tie up this little portion of the discussion. This is a well-known symbol in C, N-U-L-Ls, all in capital letters. It is the traditional symbol used. Uh, it comes from C into C++, and it's supposed to be a symbol representing the null pointer. It, it really, in truth, it's nothing but an alias for zero, but it allows people to use that symbol in their code, and it makes the code a little bit more self-documenting than just seeing a zero. But it can lead to unintuitive behavior because here we have an overload between int and pointer. And if you call f of null, most people have been trained to think that that is a pointer. In truth, it's the integer 0. And the function that gets called is this one. And that's an unfortunate surprise. And that's because that's the exact match. And the exact match beats the pointer conversion. Unintuitive. So that's why C, modern C++, C++11, and later, introduced a new symbol called null putter. Null putter is a constant whose type is null putter underscore t. And whatever null putter underscore t is, it is not a pointer, and it is not an integer. It is something else. And, but it has a built-in conversion, which is it can implicitly convert to any pointer type or bool, but nothing else. So what happens is, when you do this, now there's a conversion from this one to this one, but not to that one. And the one that we want to win, wins. So what, again, what's the lesson here is C++ has the ability and frequently takes advantage of the ability to transform things from one type into the other, quietly. And your understanding as a C++ programmer is improved if you realize you understand what the type is that you're starting with, and you understand what the set of available conversions are. You can then make intelligent choices about what you want to use in that setting without having surprises about the behavior. That's, that's the key point. So, yeah, null putter doesn't convert to int. Let me give you another example of uh, where these things come into play. C++ lets you overload operators. A nice little example of that is, um, suppose that you would like to have a type that represents exact fractions, rational numbers that store a numerator and a denominator. Um, See, floating point numbers have rounding errors. This gives you exact representations of things that you couldn't otherwise get. And with operator overloading, you can do things like that or that. And it makes it look built in, very nice and convenient. And writing a class like that is not all that difficult. You would have things like some constructors that says, you know, make me a rational with a particular numerator and denominator, that sort of thing. And then you would define operators like an assignment operator, a plus operator, a multiply operator. And by the way, the underlying implementation is that it simply has two data members, one of which is a numerator and one of the other is a denominator. So there's a, a quick sketch of our rational class. 
We want to be able to write expressions like that. How does the compiler translate that? Well, first thing is, it knows that the plus operator has a higher precedence than equals, so it groups it like that. And then it looks and says, that is not a built-in plus because these things are not built-in operands. So it must be that it turns it into a member function call. It actually just transforms this into that, where this becomes the object to the left of the dot. The operator plus becomes the function name and this becomes the right-hand operand. And then it sees this equals and says that's not a built-in assignment because those are rationals. It must be that that translates into that. That's what happens. Now, the whole point of doing this kind of operator overloading is so that if you and I are working on a project together, I can do all of this work to build this class and I can hand it to you. And if I have made rational numbers look and act like the built-in types with which you are already familiar, then you can just use this like it's a built-in type and you, your intuition about how to use it will just guide you to use it correctly. And so one of the things that's very reasonable to expect is that you should be able to, just like you can say double plus an integer or a long integer here, you should be able to say rational plus long. And what should happen is it should turn that n into n over 1, a rational number, and go ahead and add it. Just like here, it implicitly converts that into a double and adds it. It should implicitly convert that. And the way you do that in C++ is something called a user-defined conversion. And the most common form of a user-defined conversion is something called a converting constructor. See, this is normally what is used in declarations to initialize a rational number with an initial value. But the compiler will also use this constructor as an implicit conversion from long into rational. And the way it looks is like that. You can just say R1 plus N, and the compiler says, oh, you must have meant R1 plus rational N. In other words, take that N, pass it to the constructor. And in truth, what's happening is, again, it's as if you declared a temporary object T of type rational and it pass N as the argument to the constructor. It then does the arithmetic, puts the result into R2, and then T vanishes. See, it's the same the same machinery. It's creating a temporary object that holds the converted result and uses that. This is the way type transformations, implicit transformations behave in C++. And so, now what happens if we change this type to int instead of long? The constructor for rational was expecting an int. I'm sorry, it was expecting a long, we gave it an int. The compiler says, that's not a problem. I'll first convert the long, the integer into a long, and I'll take the long and pass it to the argument as to the constructor. The compiler will chain more than one conversion together in order to make this work. It's what's known as a conversion sequence. And once again, the compiler ranks these things. User-defined conversions are more expensive than, than built-in standard conversions. So if you have two overloaded functions here, one takes a double and one takes a rational, which is cheaper, the conversion of int to double or the conversion of int to rational? The answer is int to double. And so that's the winner. All this stuff is ranked. A single argument constructor is a conversion by default, but you can turn it off. If you want to have a constructor, but you don't want the compiler using this to implicitly convert a long into a rational, you just put the word explicit on the front of it, and that says, this can only be used if I do it explicitly. It, it means that the implicit conversions will be turned off. Now, not only do we want um, these conversions to apply 
oh yeah, here's the way to express it is we're used to doing this with doubles. I can say double times two or two times double. I should be able to say rational times two, two times rational. But it turns out based on what I've written, that doesn't work. The second one doesn't work. And so C++ gives you a technique for solving that problem, which is instead of implementing the operator, the multiply operator as a member of the class, you can, you can, you know, the thing is that this seems reasonable but doesn't work. What you do instead is, I'm just going to scroll ahead, is you can make it a non-member function. Instead of making it a member function, you declare it as a non-member of the class and it has two named operands like that. So that when the compiler sees R1 times 2 or 2 times R1, it will apply a conversion either to the right operand or to the left operand. That's the way that works. <clears throat> and what the compiler will do is this. So here's the key point is that Oh, this is just a detail, is that the compile, these non-members are going to need access to private members, so we make them friends, but that's, that's a detail. So you can either implement the multiply operator as a member, or you can implement it as a non-member. Notice that when it's a member, it has a named operand on the right, and it has because it's a member, it has an implicit operand on the left, which is this. When you make it um, a non-member, what would have been the left operand is now uh, the first function argument. And the basic difference is that when you make a function a member, it only does conversions on the right operand, but not on the left operand. But when you make it a a non-member function, you can get conversions on either the left or this up. The last thing that I wanted to illustrate was that you could transform this rational class into a template. The motivation for doing that is that you might want to have precision other than just long. So we can do something like this. We can say a rational with long, long integers for the numerator and denominator or a rational with unsigned integers for the numerator and denominator. And so what you do then is you would turn the rational class into a template. And when you turn it into a template, there's a bunch of scaffolding that you have to put in. It gets kind of verbose, you have to add that, and then you have to add, all, add that. It gets a little wordy, but the one thing you get in return is that now when you declare a rational number, you have control over the arithmetic precision. And you can, as a template, you can get R1 plus R2 to work, which is great. We get something that's more general than we had before and it seems to work. But if, if you're not careful, this function functionality fails you. In other words, the first pass at the template, most people find that then when they say R2 plus 1, that doesn't work anymore. The compiler stops doing the conversions on the integers. And the question is, what's happening there? And it's that when plus was an overloaded function, then we were using the mechanism we looked at a little while ago called overload resolution. And overload resolution applies a very generous set of conversions in order to get the arguments to match. It's very generous, as we just saw. But when you're using a template, then this plus is itself a function template, and, and now we're using a mechanism called template argument deduction. And for reasons of time, we don't have, I, I can't go into all the details, I just wanted to make you aware that this is something that you'll have to learn about as you get better at C++, which is, the template argument deduction, the key point is, it uses a lot fewer implicit conversions in order to find a match. And so what happens here is, this, when this turns into a template, 
the conversion needed to turn that into a rational disappears. And, and these rules are all built into C++. And as you learn C++, it turns out it makes sense that it behaves this way. But at first it seems surprising because the template has all these nice properties, but it loses something that we generally think is valuable, namely a rich set of conversions. And so we don't want to have to do this. We'd like to have a way of solving the problem another way. And I will just plant this little thing in your mind, which is that there is a programming idiom called the making new friends idiom, which involves taking a member, a, a non-member function like this and not only declaring it, but defining it inside the class. And, and when you research this, what you'll find out is the magic of making new friends is that it shifts the plus operator away from deduction, argument deduction, back into overload resolution, and then you get the conversions that you want back. And I, I realize that this is a lot of detail to absorb, and I did not expect you to, but what I expect you to take away from this is to remember these key points, which is here, that again, every object and constant has an innate type. When you look at the expressions, be aware that things, everything in there starts out with a type. However, C++ will quietly transform expressions from one type to another. <clears throat> And these transformations may have a cost in time and space. So you may want to do things to avoid those implicit conversions like using the keyword explicit or like using member functions instead of non-member functions to avoid transformations on the left operand. There are techniques like that. The permitted transformations will not be the same in all contexts. As we just saw, there's a difference between overload resolution and template argument deduction. And you have control over it. And you can use idioms like making new friends, for example, to turn on or turn off the set of available conversions. And that's it. Thank you.